Good morning, church. <laughs> and thank you, Kayla, for our prelude this morning. Um, it's good to be together in worship this morning, uh, whether you're joining us here in person or online. Good morning to our online community as well. Um, we invite you all, as usual, to visit our website, www.fumchurch.com. Um, we still have all of our bulletins, all of our Sunday takeaways, um, all of our announcements and everything going on um, as we are together and serving together in the church. Um, so this morning, um, as we begin our worship together, may we meet today with love. May we meet today with praise and with thanksgiving. May we surrender to the reminder of ourselves that through it all, that God is good. Amen, church? Amen. God is good all the time. There is reason to give thanks. There is reason to be hopeful, to sing praises, to move forward. May we meet today with love. So church, I invite you to join me in our call to worship this morning. That'll be shown on the screen. Will you stand with us? As we gather this day, each of us brings something to worship. We bring the burdens of the week. We bring prayers of hope, prayers of anguish. We bring our voices and our offerings and our questions. We bring our faith, tattered or whole as it may be. We bring all of this to each other and to God, whom we worship today. Amen. Amen. Let us open our worship this morning with Blessed Assurance, number 369 in the hymnals.
amen, church. We know our stories are not complete without Jesus and without the perfect love of God. So, church, I invite you this morning uh, to join me in our prayer of confession that will be shown on the screen. We have sinned this week, O oh Lord, in word, thought, and deed. We have said things we ought to not to have said and withheld praise when it should have been given. We have thought that which was unkind, unholy, and unprofitable, and we have failed to think the thoughts of love, peace, and righteousness your spirit would have given us. We have been busy about many things that should have not occupied our time and have neglected to do those things that would have served others and pleased you. We ask that your grace and mercy be upon us to forgive our sins, heal our brokenness, and return us to ways that are profitable to your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And hear these words of assurance that's shown on our screen. God's forgiveness is as everlasting as the ages. His mercy is as wide as the seas. Surely he will forgive our sins. He will restore a right spirit within us. Amen. Amen. Church, you may be seated.
good it is to know that we have uh, just so many musical gifts and talents um, that just sing and play and uh, praise the Lord. Amen, church? Amen. Yeah. So uh, this morning we are turning to our scripture, um, Acts 11, verses 1 through 18. Now the apostles and the brothers and sisters who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, Why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Then Peter began to explain it to them, step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, by no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has entered my mouth. But a second time, the voice answered from heaven, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times. Then everything was pulled up again to heaven. At that very moment, three men sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were. The Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me, and when we entered the man's house, he told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house saying, send to Joppa and bring Simon, who was called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? When they heard this, they were silenced, and they praised God, saying, then God has given even the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, thank you for that wonderful anthem this morning. Um, I think the choir was swaying as they were singing. Awesome. And we look forward to uh, our handbells in, uh, in a few minutes after the message this morning. You know, isn't it wonderful how, how God is always on time? God is uh, never early. God is never late. God is always on time. You might not be aware of it, but God is always moving in your life at just the right time. And often God is moving in people that God brings to support you, to encourage you at just the the right time. It was late June of 1979. Betsy and I had been married all of two weeks. And we were excited and we were nervous because we had just arrived with our dads and our U-Haul trailer on the campus of United Theological Seminary in Dayton, Ohio. So Betsy and her dad, Bill, and my dad, Earl, and I, we walked up to the door of Roberts Hall, which was to be our seminary home, and we rang the buzzer. And soon, this young student named Todd, who's sitting right over there this morning, he's the guy with the beard, uh, he came down the steps toward the door to welcome us to campus. And at first, looking through the glass door, we could see only his flip-flops, his shorts, and his hairy legs. And then we saw more of him. We saw the warm smile from his bearded face. Welcome, he said. Come in. And so into an old rickety elevator and up three floors we went, following Todd to our new apartment, which was just down the hall from his apartment with his young bride, Debbie, where they lived. And after we got our belongings moved in, uh, the Carters invited the four of us to dinner. And we could not have imagined on that warm day in June 1979 how our friendship would bloom and grow as it has across years and miles. They now live in Anchorage, Alaska. And across children and now grandchildren 
And uh, so I'm happy that you're here with us today. We haven't seen each other for a while. Back in 1979, none of us realized uh, what this friendship would mean for us as we were responding to the call to ministry. And we didn't realize that God was at work, even then, creating a relationship that would bless us in so many ways through so many seasons of life, so many seasons of ministry. You know, that's how it is when you follow Jesus. You come to see that even when you're not aware of it, God is at work at just the right time to provide just what you need. And God brings people into our lives to remind us that God is with us. God is at work in your life and has brought people into your life to remind you that God is with you. Now, here's the thing I want to focus on this morning, though. And that is that God wants to use you as a follower of Jesus to bless others beyond what you might even today realize. Today, as we continue this series, we've called We Are Witnesses, and we look at this wonderful story in the book of Acts. I invite you to consider this question. How do I join what God is doing? What does it look like for me to join what God wants to do in people's lives today? And as we follow Peter in Acts chapter 11, we discover some things about how to see what God is doing and then how to join in what God is doing. And first of all, the story of Peter shows us that to join what God is doing, we need to stay flexible. Stay flexible. The Spirit is frequently moving in surprising ways. You know, this story that Sarah read for us a couple minutes ago, it was so important in the early church that Luke, who gives such attention to detail, tells the story twice. He tells it in Acts chapter 10, and then he retells it in our reading for this morning in Acts chapter 11. When Peter is telling his story, to the disciples and others gathered there in Jerusalem. There is no issue that was more debated by early Christians than whether this newfound faith that they had in Jesus, was it intended only for the Jews, or was it also to include the Gentiles? All Christians were Jews at first, you know. Jesus was a Jew, the 12 disciples were all Jewish, the first hundred 20 followers were Jews. The first 5,000 were all Jews. And then the good news spread out to the Hellenistic Jews. They didn't speak Hebrew. They spoke Greek, but they were still Jews who had come to Christ. And then it spread out even farther among the Samaritans who were half Jewish. But the gospel at this point, it had not gone out to non-Jews. But the thing is that God's heart was not just for the Jewish people, but for people of every nation everywhere. He loves them. And so all of a sudden, God is giving this Roman soldier named Cornelius a dream. And at the same time, God is giving the apostle Peter a vision on a rooftop. Peter has gone from Joppa, a Jewish town, to Caesarea, a Roman town, which some have described as being like the Las Vegas of its day. And there he leads this Roman guard to faith in Jesus Christ. And it's an amazing conversion story, except that as we begin this chapter, we discover that not everybody is so excited about Peter sitting down and breaking bread with a Gentile. Devout Jews are not supposed to associate with non-Jews. So over the next five chapters of the book of Acts, the question is, do you have to become Jewish in order to follow Jesus. And praise God, if you look ahead, you discover, well, the answer is no. 
You don't have to be Jewish, and I'm thankful for that, and I'm sure you are too, that they saw that God's grace is for everyone, including the Gentiles. Now, because the early church was flexible enough to go with where the Spirit was leading, you and I come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior today. Now, we notice as we read this how the church figured all this out together. Peter has a dream, Cornelius has a dream, and the church gets together to figure out what does all this mean? From the very start, Acts is showing us that there is no such thing as a solo Christian. That's why we're always encouraging everybody to join a Sunday school class, to get involved in a small group, because in our togetherness as brothers and sisters in Christ, we help each other to see what God is up to. And in our togetherness, we encourage each other to be witnesses out in those places where God calls us to be from day to day. We need each other because this story shows us that if we join in what God is doing in the world, we have to be flexible because the Holy Spirit is always in the business of change. And you know how that is. Change is difficult for us. It was difficult for Peter. There he was in Joppa, praying on the rooftop of the home of Simon the Tanner, when suddenly he has this vision, this large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners. And Peter described it this way to those up in Jerusalem. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, birds of the air, I also heard a voice saying to me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, not what the choir sang this morning. I replied, no, Lord, no, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. See, Jewish law forbade eating the things described here in this vision And as I read this, you know, I I feel like we have to give Peter a break. Because if God asks you to kill and eat a beast of prey like a lion, or a reptile like a lizard, or a bird like a crow, would you kill it and eat it? You'd have to be really, really hungry, I'm sure. Peter looks at the food on that sheet and he says, no, Lord, no. But a second time this voice comes back from heaven. What God has made clean, you must not call unclean. And notice this voice came back a third time to make sure that Peter would understand that this overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God is for everyone, and that no one, not even the Gentiles, are beyond the reach of God's love in Jesus Christ. Now, as I'm reading this, I'm thinking about uh, Pastor Rudy Rasmus. Rudy has served St. John's United Methodist Church in Houston for 25 years, And when Rudy was appointed there, that church was ready to close its doors. It's in a very, very rough section of Houston. But today, St. John's is a large, thriving congregation where wealthy business people and middle class and homeless people unite and share the love of Jesus with each other and with their neighbors. Several years ago, Betsy and I had the opportunity to worship at St. John's when we were in Houston, and we met Rudy and talked with him. He's got some Harrisburg connections, and also his wife, Winita. He's the one uh, that began the service, I love you, and there's nothing you can do about it. I love you, and there's nothing you can do about it. Well, Rudy uh, 
wrote a book telling the story of St. John's, and he entitled it Simply Touch. And it's a really great book. And what I love most about it is that at the end, there's a test. And the test is called a touch test. And Rudy goes on for three pages giving descriptions of all kinds of people. And the test is, circle the ones that you would not feel comfortable sitting next to in church. And as I read this three-page list, I'm thinking, if that person came in and sat next to me in church, looking like that or smelling like that, I might be a little uncomfortable. In fact, I probably would be. Who is it? that if they came inside of this church on a Sunday morning would grab your attention because they're different from most of the rest of us. Peter tells his critics up in Jerusalem, the Spirit told me, the Spirit told me to go with them, with these men that had come to take him to Cornelius. And the Spirit told me not to make a distinction between them and us. As human beings, we make distinctions all the time between them and us, them people and us. But God, God looks at every person as a precious child of God. And like Peter, God calls followers of Jesus today to stay flexible, open to how the Holy Spirit might move in your life to help you bring someone to know the love of Jesus, even though they might be very different from you. How can I join in what God is doing? I can stay flexible. But then number two... Stay rigid on people's need for Jesus. Peter continues on in telling his story to those up in Jerusalem. He says to his brothers there, Look, I didn't want to go into that Gentile's house either, but God told me to do it, and I obeyed. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, Peter says, who was I that I could hinder God? Who was I to stand in God's way when God wanted to bring this person to Jesus? God will move where God will move. And our job is not to be the Jesus referee. Our job is to join with what Jesus is doing in the world. Let's read these next couple of very familiar verses together. Some of you probably know them by heart. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Now, you may notice that in those two verses, the phrase, the world, is used four different times. God so loved the world God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Jesus keeps repeating that phrase because he wants to say, do you get the point? The world, it's every person. And God's yearning in Jesus Christ is for every person to believe, for every person to be saved, for every person to have eternal life. That's the vision that Jesus gave to the disciples on the day of his ascension in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that we looked at a couple weeks ago. Jesus says, 
You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We are called to be rigid about the need of every person for Jesus. Preacher Thomas Long tells the story about a woman named Grace Thomas. Grace was born early in the 20th century, the second of five children. Her father was a streetcar conductor in Birmingham, Alabama, and Grace grew up in modest circumstances. Later in life, after she got married and moved to Georgia, Grace took a clerking job at the state capitol in Atlanta where she developed a fondness for politics and law. And so even though she was a full-time mother and had a full-time job, she enrolled in night school to study law. In 1954, Grace shocked her family by announcing that she was going to run for public office. And what's more, Grace didn't want to run for drain commissioner or even city council. Grace ran for governor of the state of Georgia. And there were nine candidates on the ballot of her party that year. Nine candidates, but they all focused on one issue, the big issue in 1954, which was whether schools should be desegregated or not. And Grace Thomas was the only one of those nine candidates that thought that schools should be desegregated. I loved her campaign slogan. It said, say grace at the polls. Well, hardly anyone did say grace at the polls. She came in last place out of nine candidates. And her family was kind of relieved. She got that out of her system. Except she didn't. And she ran again for governor in 1962. By then, the tensions around racial issues were far more difficult than they had been those eight years earlier. And Grace's platform on race issues earned her a number of death threats that year. Well, one day she held a rally in a small Georgia town. And she chose as her venue the old slave market on the town square. And as she stood there, she motioned to the platform where human beings had been bought and sold as slaves. And she said, the old has passed away. The new has come. A new day has come when all people in Georgia, white and black, can join hands and work together. And as she was saying this, this red-faced man in the crowd interrupted her. And he blurted out, Are you a communist? Why, no, Grace replied. Well, then, where did you get all these crazy ideas? And Grace pointed to the steeple of the Baptist church across the street from where she was. And she said to the man, I learned them in Sunday school. You see, Grace, Grace had spent time listening to the Holy Spirit at work through God's holy word addressing her life. And what she heard in Sunday school, it was more important to her than what she heard among all the political wrangling out there in the culture. And it gave her a very specific mission in life. You might say, you might say that grace had a heart that every person would know the love of Jesus. How do I join in what God is doing? I do it by staying flexible, knowing that the Holy Spirit moves in surprising ways. And I do it by staying rigid on the fact that people need Jesus. Everyone does. And then there's one more thing. God calls us to stay committed. Stay committed to telling your story. 
You know, this story in Acts chapter 11, it has a really remarkable ending when you think about it. I mean, the story starts with these apostles and other believers being critical of Peter for sitting down at table with a Gentile. And it ends with the apostles and believers not throwing Peter out, but praising God that now even the Gentiles are invited to receive the gospel. Now, we give all the credit to the work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of those gathered that day with Peter. But it's important to notice that when the apostles and disciples question Peter as to why he broke bread with the Gentile, Peter doesn't argue with them. Peter doesn't stand there and debate with them. Peter tells them his story. His story about how the Holy Spirit had been moving in his life to bring him to that place. Then Peter began to explain it step by step, we're told, at the beginning of this text. You see, it's the story, not the argument, not the debate, not the post on Facebook. It's the story that changes hearts. It's your story. It's my story. Story of how it was at just the right time, in just the right way. God moved in your life. It's stories that change hearts and lives. And Peter told his story in such a way that what he experienced, it could have happened in the life of any of those apostles. He was not seeking to break rules, not trying to create a disturbance. God had intervened in his life, and he wanted to share the story with others. When they heard this, they were silenced, Acts says. And they praised God, saying, Then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. Beloved, we are witnesses. And every one of us has a story of what God has done and what God is doing in our lives. A story to share with our children. A story to share with our grandchildren. A story to convey to our friends to our family. May we be flexible so that we're open to opportunities the Spirit gives us. And may we be rigid, believing in the yearning of God's heart for every person we meet, regardless of who it is or what they look like. May we be convinced that God uses people like you, like me, in all the circumstances of our lives. God uses us if we're open to it so that others might come to know the love of Jesus Christ and find salvation in him. I would invite you now to stand with me and uh, let's join together in singing this song in openness to how the Holy Spirit is moving among us today.
Please be seated. Let's join our hearts in prayer. Alleluia. Come, Spirit, come. Spirit of God, we praise you for your presence with us when we gather in worship together. We praise you for your presence in the love that we share as sisters and brothers in Christ. Praise you for your presence in the gift of music, the anthem of the choir, the anthem of the bell choir, the voices lifted in praise to you together in worship. Spirit, we praise you that you seek to enter each of our hearts in the midst of the things that we celebrate and the things that we struggle with. Spirit of God, we praise you that you are here. And we pray that you would give us grace today so that as we leave the church, we would know that in every day of our lives you are moving too calling us, your people, to walk with Jesus. To walk with Jesus into places where we have an opportunity to share his love. Give us words to speak at the right time and fill us with the desire to serve others in a way that they would see your love through them as well. Lord, we hold before you today a world in need of your presence in so many ways. We pray, Lord, for your peace, for your peace in Ukraine and Eastern Europe and in all of those places, Lord, where people live in the midst of violence and war. May they know your peace. We pray for your presence, Lord, in places where people struggle with illness and disease. We're aware of those even, Lord, from our church family who need the touch of your hand today. And loved ones near to us, we also pray for their healing. And Lord, we pray for all who grieve. We think especially today of the family of Lincoln Washburn, especially his wife, Valois, and their children and grandchildren as Lincoln passed on to eternal life yesterday. Bless and keep all who mourn and keep before them the great promise of life eternal in Jesus. Lord, we pray also for the blessing of your spirit upon those affected by violence in places like Buffalo and Milwaukee, where there has been more gun violence. Be with those in our communities who protect us and who govern and make important decisions that impact our lives. And Holy Spirit, we pray for your blessing upon our church and every church in this community and beyond. May we, in the way we love each other, in the way we unite together, may we witness to your great love. And may we have hearts that go out beyond the walls of the church and into the community to serve in all the ways you call us to do that. Teach us, Lord, to stay flexible, and teach us to stay rigid in knowing that every person is loved by you and that you desire them all. This we ask in the name of Jesus, our Lord, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now we welcome our bell choir to lead us as we continue in worship. Oh, that was great. Thank you so much. And we look forward to next Sunday when we have our annual bell concert here uh, in the church sanctuary. That's uh, at seven o'clock next Sunday evening. And uh, we are so grateful for the ways that all of you um, stay quiet during church and then get up and ring those bells so beautifully. It's wonderful. Yes. So it is a joy to welcome all of you uh, to worship again, as uh, Sarah did earlier, and we're grateful for the many ways that uh, we can be involved in worship, in small groups, in study together, as well as in serving in our community. We have a few announcements to share with you this morning, and we also invite you, as Sarah said, to visit our church website, uh, where you'll find a copy of today's bulletin and teaching notes, as well as uh, a number of ways for us to continue to grow as disciples of Jesus. So as I mentioned uh, earlier, next Sunday evening is our uh, annual handbell uh, concert, and uh, 
We have another big event coming up this afternoon, if we can see that up on the screen. The Mechanicsburg Ecumenical Choir Concert, today at 3 o'clock down at St. Joseph's. Our own Kathy Bittenbender is directing, and Karen Philp, our accompanist, will be accompanying that uh, choir made up of churches from around our community, and we encourage you to attend today at uh, 3 o'clock. We also uh, look forward to next Sunday when we have our handbell concert, and also during the Sunday school hour uh, next uh, week, we have a special program on grief and loss uh, led by Patty Vogel, who has a ministry here uh, in our church uh, where she is involved in uh, helping people through uh, grief and loss experiences. It's going to be a very helpful Uh, time together in this season in particular that we have been in uh, over these past couple of years. And so we hope that next Sunday, during the Sunday school hour, if you can, that you would want to attend uh, in the multi-purpose room. And uh, so uh, we also look forward to June 12th when we uh, have a fellowship event at the Senator's baseball game, beginning with a picnic at noon or immediately following the 11 o'clock service and uh, also then enjoy a baseball game together. We've done this uh, over the years a number of times and it's always a great time. And we invite you, if you like to go to the Senator's game and want to enjoy some fellowship that day, to, uh, to reach out and, uh, and get more information and tickets for, for that. So as we continue to celebrate together, and as we prepare to go forth in the name of Jesus, will you please stand and join in singing our closing hymn.
great song for us to carry with us as we end our worship here and go out into the world as disciples of Jesus. I love to tell the story. For those who know it best seem hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit go with you today and always. Amen.